All right, we're starting 2 Corinthians 13 today. This will finish the letter to uh, the Corinthians. We've uh, finished 1 Corinthians, and this finishes 2 Corinthians. So we'll be done with the uh, all the writing uh, Paul did to the Corinthian church. So we'll always start off with our uh, concept that uh, these letters are about experiential righteousness, phase two, sanctification. They're not letters that have to do with phase one, sanctification. Uh, sorry, phase one, justification. Uh, they're about phase two, sanctification or experiential righteousness, where we're progressively conformed to the image of Christ by His grace as we walk in the Spirit. And uh, started this couple of weeks ago talking about what Peter uh, commanded every Christian to do, which is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we said that there, in order to do that, there's a process uh, that you need to go through. And that is, uh, we gave that the acronym IBAR, which is to individually go positive to the Word of God, build your library of Scripture so that you can learn to live by faith, which then activates the life by the Spirit, where you're yielded to the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, filled by means of the Spirit, and led by the Spirit. And when you do that, um, this results in the fruit produced by the Spirit and born by the believer, which is in, found in Galatians 5.22, having to do with love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, gentleness, and so forth. And those things are the production of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of what a mature Christian uh, looks like. So it's a great process. And, and that process just is one that you continue throughout your entire life. You never finish it. You just keep uh, growing um, in your sanctification throughout your entire uh, Christian life. Here's our quiz from chapter 12. And uh, true or false, Paul was very confused or he was hallucinating when he described an imaginary trip to heaven that he says occurred 14 years ago. There were no witnesses. Seems he just pulled this out of his hat to try and top anything the false apostles could claim. Uh, that's false. This was uh, actually very true. Uh, he described this. Um, actually happened to him. It was the first time that he had brought it up, made it public. And uh, he said that he was not able to speak about a lot of the things that he had seen there, uh, prevented from, from speaking about those kind of things, unlike a lot of people who today uh, claim to have gone to heaven and they write all about their experiences. Uh, Paul says he was prevented from doing so. True or false, Paul had a thorn in the flesh that Dr. Luke could have easily removed, but Paul wanted it done by prayer rather than by medical treatment. He believed in faith healing over medical science. Uh, that's false. This uh, thorn in the flesh was something obviously that uh, caused Paul to suffer. Um, whether it was we don't really know what this thorn in the flesh was, and there was there's all kinds of speculations as to what it was, but apparently it wasn't anything that Dr. Luke could have removed. Paul prayed for its removal, and the Lord actually revealed to him, spoke to him directly, and said no, he was not going to remove that. He wanted Paul to be weak, uh, and in that weakness, uh, the Lord would make him strong. So there's something for us to learn about. Um, faith healing is, uh, people were sometimes healed back in those days, but uh, miracle healings, but uh, that doesn't seem to be the case today. And uh, can, can God heal somebody as a miracle today? Absolutely he can. Um, but it, uh, there, it just doesn't seem to happen uh, very often. 
today. Medical science is what God's given us to deal with these things today. And uh, oftentimes God does want us to suffer and it's for a particular uh, reason, just as he had Paul suffering in those days. True or false, Paul asked the Lord three times to remove the thorn in Paul's flesh, but the Lord told Paul directly that his grace was sufficient for him for his power is perfected in Paul's weakness. And Paul accepted this and from then on he believed Christ that when he was weak, then he was strong and he stopped asking for that thorn to be removed. And that's true, already talked about that. True or false, Paul stated the marks of a true apostle were the ones he had performed among them, signs, wonders, and miracles. And these were authenticated by his teaching of sound doctrine, uh, which he gave three categories of soteriology, doctrine of salvation, Christology, doctrine of Christ, and pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's possible that the false apostles had claimed these marks as well, um, but their doctrine was not sound since they taught another, another gospel, another Christ, and another spirit. Since Paul said they were agents of Satan, the uh, signs that they produced were also of Satan and not of God, so they were counterfeit signs and wonders. Remember that uh, um, <coughs> Satan is able to counterfeit almost everything that Christ did and to present himself as the a true one and to lead people astray. So we have to be very careful when you start seeing the next bunch of signs and wonders that are gonna be appearing on the earth are gonna be coming from the Antichrist. In the meantime, there may be people who are able to do signs and wonders. And when you see that, uh, you, will, you will see that they are actually from Satan. They will teach false doctrine if you're carefully uh, observing them. Uh, true or false, Paul was concerned that when he came uh, this third time, he would find the Corinthians had lost their phase one salvation since there might be further broken fellowship and lack of repentance from their earlier pagan practices false. He was not looking for them to lose their salvation. Paul was not a uh, lordship salvation guy. He was not Arminian in his theology of salvation. Uh, he was concerned particularly about their sanctification, not their justification. Big picture of 2 Corinthians, been through a bunch of times, but chapter 13, this concluding chapter, is a continuation of the end of chapter 12. We're still on the same subject of Paul's third visit to them, his genuine concern for them. This is a difficult group of people for sure, but Paul never says that, that they are not saved. Or that they are law, that or that they have lost their salvation. Have they been and are still some of them still carnal? Yes. Are some of them still baby Christians? Yes. Is Paul coming to condemn them and to tr try to save them again? No. He is coming to look at the fruit of their experiential sanctification, phase two of salvation. Um, he, if necessary, will initiate church discipline for the purpose of bringing repentance and correction to the church not to save them again. So here we go into the uh, scriptures, 2 Corinthians 13, verse one. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In matters of serious public sin in the church for an accusation to be considered fact, it required two or three witnesses. This is very much like the plurality of witnesses in Israel's judicial system. <clears throat> Paul quotes Deuteronomy 17.6 here to make that point. It's serious business. Likely he's referring to those that are still clinging to the false apostles and rejecting Paul, the true apostles. Additionally, he could be referring to the carnal Christians remaining there. Corinth was known for its sexual immorality with temple prostitutes, which was part of their culture. The Corinthians were just coming out of that culture. Verse two, I've previously said, when present a second time, and though now absent, I say in advance, <coughs> to those who have sinned in the past, and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Paul warns that it doesn't matter who it is in the church who has slipped back into this practice. 
They will face church discipline by him. He is giving another warning and a period of grace for them to repent on their own before he gets there. Since you're seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me and who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, the false apostles had cast doubt that Paul was really an apostle since he was always so meek with them face to face, but would write really tough letters. Paul says this time they're going to see the proof that Paul is, is in Christ and Christ is in him and speaks authoritatively for Christ in these matters. Verse 4, for indeed he was crucified because of weakness, yet he lives because of the power of God. For we also are weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed toward you. Jesus was truly a human being like us in all respects except sin. While still being 100% God, he did not have to allow his humanity to undergo torture and crucifixion and death. As God, he could have called legions of angels to protect him and destroy all his enemies, but he voluntarily died for us, a substitutionary death in our place, and he took the full penalty for our sins and the sins of the whole world and God raised him from the dead. He continues on as both 100% God and 100% man. In his humanity and his divinity, he sits at the right hand of the Father today as our great high priest, the one mediator between God and man who makes intercession for us, who is the head of the church. Because he died for us in weakness, we died with him in weakness. Because he was raised in power from the dead, we too will be raised in power from the dead. Christ is not currently functioning as king of kings. He is going to be that when he returns to set up the kingdom, but he is not currently functioning in that role. Uh, verse 5, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourself? that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. So I've just noted here, context, context, context. <clears throat> People rip verses out of context often, and they use it to support some theological bent that they have. This one is a very abused passage when it's ripped out of context, and it just scares the heck out of people. You can see that if you hold to a, a lordship salvation view, where you must demonstrate your salvation by works. And if you don't demonstrate your salvation, it means that you were never saved. You didn't have enough faith or your faith was not saving faith to begin with. Or you maybe hold to an Arminian view, which means that you can lose your salvation by your sins. This would be a go-to verse for them to prove that you were never really saved or that you have <clears throat> somehow lost your salvation along the way. <clears throat> when isolated from its context, you can make it sound very much like that, but you cannot interpret scripture like that. Context is always king, <clears throat> and you must keep uh, your verses in context. What is the context of this passage? Well, Paul is writing to, first of all, saved Corinthians. He has never once questioned their phase one justification, <clears throat> and he is not questioning it here. This verse falls in view of church discipline, and so must be addressing their walk or phase two sanctification. The Bible never tells us to look at ourselves to see if we are justified. That would be saying that salvation somehow comes from us by our works. You will never get the correct answer <clears throat> or have any assurance of your salvation by looking at your heart, which the Bible says is desperately wicked, or even at your works, which unless they're done by the power of the Spirit <clears throat> after you are justified, uh, it, they're like dirty rags to God, filthy rags to God. So your works can't save you. Your heart, no matter what you think you, your heart is telling you, that's not how you're saved. You're saved by the finished work of one and only Jesus Christ. 
And it, whether your heart tells you that you've been saved or not is not the issue. It is a, um, a head thing. It is placing your faith or trust. It takes the facts of Jesus Christ's death and says, I'm going to trust Jesus and not myself, not my feelings about salvation, but the fact that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I'm going to trust that and not anything that's in me, which is corrupted, uh, and any of the works that I could do toward my own salvation. When we look for evidence of our justification, <clears throat> we look to the source, what Christ did on our behalf for our phase one salvation. You contributed nothing to his works. He's the one who did it all, 100% of everything needed for the, for the Father to declare us justified. We receive, we receive his salvation by means of faith. That is, trust in Christ and Christ alone. John's gospel makes this clear. Paul's writings make this clear. The rest of the epistles make this clear. In fact, the entire Bible makes clear that salvation is always by faith alone and is provided by God alone without any works offered by any man other than the God-man Jesus Christ. So this cannot be about phase one. Consistent with what Paul has been addressing in all the rest of 1 Corinthians and the other 12 chapters of 2 Corinthians, Paul must be referring to phase two of salvation, which is sanctification. So in context, Paul is commanding them to test and examine their sanctification, not their justification. Are they walking according to the principles of the Christian faith per Paul's teachings? To support this idea, Paul says, do you not recognize that Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Recognize is the Greek word epignosto, and translates to have thorough knowledge gained through learning. Fail the test is translated from adokimos, and everywhere else in the New Testament refers to Christians. <clears throat> all Christians are in Christ, but not all Christians are in fellowship with Christ, abiding in him. Due to the unconfessed sin, a believer is still in Christ, but is not in fellowship with Christ. This is the test Paul's referring to. If you fail the test, it means you're not in fellowship with Christ. You're not making progress in sanctification because Christ is not directing your walk. So again, this is not a test as to whether they are saved or not, but whether they are walking consistent with their sanctification. When we are in fellowship with him, abiding in him, his life is poured out through us as we walk by faith. Were they practicing IBAR, that process we use to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? It becomes very obvious who is and who is not uh, because some were still carnal after having been saved five years ago. No growth, but still saved. Some were still babies in the faith, but still saved, just not much growth. After five years, Paul expected them to be mature Christians, spiritual. The principle of testing, testing and examining your walk applied to the whole church then and is an ongoing individual responsibility today for every Christian. It will be good for those who take care of this before Paul gets there, but Paul likely has church discipline in mind for the specific group who has stubbornly held on to these false teachers. They will need to repent in front of the whole church or to be put out of the church when Paul comes. They have been warned previously. Verse 6, But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the, the test. Paul and Titus and Timothy were role models for the walk in the Spirit. We've used the acronym FROGS or IBAR. Like any process, it should yield, uh, yield the right results. The Corinthians saw the right results in these men, the results of the fruit of the Spirit, which they bore. A good process check for your walk in the Spirit is, am I bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22. Do I see that in my life and do others notice it? If not, your growth process is breaking down in one or more areas, likely starting with the individual growth. That means you're not studying, you're not learning, you're not hearing. Maybe you took a break. Uh, from studying and that break turned into weeks and months 
and now it's just not a necessary part of your daily routine like it once was. You stopped listening to sound teaching and got attracted to listening to people your friends recommended, the latest young, dynamic man or woman who just makes you feel so encouraged and makes you want to get out there and bring in the kingdom. You forget your basic principles of interpretation. You get caught up in the enthusiasm and you are hearing about a different Jesus, a different spirit and a different gospel, but it sounds so good. This is where you need to test and examine yourself to see if you are in the faith or in some other faith. If you're led away into another faith, there's no building up of your library for living by faith, faith rest. You'll be misusing scripture in ways you never dreamed. And suddenly you are influenced to believe that you have the power to speak prosperity and health into existence as a little God. You will see yourself as a God and you will not need the God of the Bible. You will not be weak but strong because you are the one who now commands things the way you desire them to be. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is your source of power to be used for making things happen that you want to happen. Your flesh becomes something to be satisfied. <clears throat> and as long as it is, it is not sin because you have not violated your conscience. Ultimately, God is there to serve you. This is idolatry and is the warning First John ends with, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Paul has made his choice and he stated it in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Huge difference in how we live the Christian life. Verse seven, now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. <clears throat> Paul reveals what he is praying for them. He could have kept it private, but he made it known to them to encourage them and to let, uh, let them know what <coughs> his concerns were for them, what he is uh, taking in prayer to God. Paul prays to God the Father, not Jesus. This is our instruction from Jesus. Pray to the Father in the name of the Son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. As believers after the cross, Jesus to pray, told us to pray in this way. So our prayer, prayer requests, like his prayer requests, are always to the Father. When Jesus was praying as a human being, he was walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. As believers, when we walk in the Spirit, we have this power as well. We ask the Father in Jesus' name, that is consistent with what Jesus would ask, which was always that the Father's will be done. The more scripture we know, the more we know about what the Father's revealed will is. The more we walk in the Spirit, the more our prayers will align with the prayers Jesus might pray today. When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit himself will pray on our behalf to the Father for exactly what we need. <clears throat> Paul prays that we that they do no wrong. Wrong is kekos, evil. We still have a sin nature. Christians are capable of doing much evil in their sin natures, particularly when they are misled by false teaching. False teaching is the doctrine of demons. Satan is pure evil, and he wants nothing more than to direct individual Christians and the body of Christ for his purpose rather than for the purpose of Christ. Paul prays that they would do what is right. Right is kalos, good, useful, praiseworthy. Rather than following the doctrine of demons, Paul prays that by God's grace, they would follow sound doctrine that he has taught them. They will do what is good. They can only do this while walking in the spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who uses the sound teaching Paul, uh, Paul taught. He renews their minds, conforms them to the image of Christ. This is all God's grace at work, of course, unless they choose the flesh over the spirit, at which time they grieve or quench the spirit. Paul and Titus and Timothy are up against these false apostles. He's already laid out the case for comparison. In the end, those who are misled by the false will see that Paul's group are the ones approved by God. God always allows people with false doctrine into a local church for a period of time. It's a way of testing that church's teaching. 
Will the elders and those who teach defend sound doctrine, or will they allow false doctrine to coexist in that church? There are warnings throughout the epistles about this issue, in particular the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Paul is telling us how he dealt with it here in 2 Corinthians. Verse 8, For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. Paul would never compromise the truth. His truth was God's truth, even when it made him look bad, as may have been the perception of the Corinthians when comparing Paul with the false apostles. The battle for the truth is almost completely lost today. In our post-Christian world, truth has no universal meaning. Postmodernism has made it so that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And so truth is whatever I decide it is, regardless of what facts or logic or arguments you can make. Religious cults have sets of beliefs that they hold fast to, but these beliefs have little to do with God's revealed truth. The canon of scripture is God's revealed truth and it is still available to read, to study, and to hear taught, but it is getting harder and harder to find. Paul prophesied about this in 2 Timothy 3 as part of the last days of the church. Are we there yet? For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. If the Corinthians have if the Corinthians have been made strong, it is because of God's power in them, just as it is in Paul. He prays for them to become spiritually mature. That word uh, for complete is catharsis, and it means to be made adequate or to be brought to maturity. For this reason, I am writing these things while absent, so that when present, I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Paul finished this prayer for them. He tells them now the purpose of the letter is so that he does not have to be confrontational with them. He has the authority of the Lord himself to be very severe or sharp or harsh with them, but he doesn't want to use that authority. He simply wants to build them up in the Lord. But if these sins remain, which he has pointed out, then it's going to be necessary for him to confront them and to correct them. He's very hopeful that they will have taken care of everything so they can have a great time of fellowship together. Verse 11, finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. He's calling for unity within the church at Corinth, something they have really struggled with because of the earlier divisions and now because of these false teachers in this small group. If they do achieve unity, they can expect to enjoy the love of God and the peace of God. Verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. You can't do this without doing verse 11, or you're being hypocrites. All the saints greet you. The other churches in Macedonia send their greetings to this church. And verse 14, the final verse, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the benediction. It's one of the most quoted benedictions in scripture because it includes the entire Trinity. Well, did the Corinthians get their act together? Apparently so. Paul got the collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem, as we previously covered. Also, he was able to write the letter of Romans from there. He mentions no troubles, uh, further troubles at Corinth. Additionally, there are no further mentions of Paul needing to revisit the church there. So <clears throat> we end here <coughs> with this letter to the Corinthians. And uh, we will actually be going into the book of Romans next because that's the next book that Paul writes. A few applications from this chapter. Public sin in the local church is a big deal and it is to be dealt with by means of church discipline. Church discipline is always designed to restore a person or persons to the fellowship of the church. If there's a lack of repentance, the person or persons are to be put out of the church until they do repent. Divisions in the church are also a big deal, and they need to be dealt with. When you have people holding to false doctrine, taking a, a stand against the rest of the church, and the teacher of the church who hold the sound doctrine, that group must be dealt with publicly as part of the church discipline as well. If the false teacher and those holding to false doctrine do not repent, they are to be put out of the church until such time as they repent. Unfortunately, a lot of the times we have these big mega churches 
who can't really very effectively deal with these two issues uh, because people don't really know each other. And you can coexist inside one of these large churches without hardly anybody knowing what's going on. A lot of the times that's why people join these large churches. They can remain sort of incognito, uh, get their own little group going, um, especially these small groups that are home groups. And you can teach an awful lot of uh, people some very bad doctrine without any uh, oversight of the uh, eldership. That's why small local churches are much better uh, than these large mega churches. Every Christian should test themselves and examine themselves on the ongoing basis to establish how their phase two sanctification is processing. Phase two sanctification is not automatic. It, re it requires attention and effort on our part. It's here that the Holy Spirit guides our works that will bring rewards at the beam of seat judgment of Christ. It's here that we want to hear the Lord say that we were faithful with what we were given. Paul tells the Corinthians uh, what he is praying for them. This is a good thing. He gives the pattern of prayer. It's to the Father in the name of the Son and by the power of the Spirit. This helps people to be encouraged by knowing that you're praying for them and to know what exactly you are praying for them. So that finishes uh, 2 Corinthians. Next week, we'll begin uh, Romans. So grace and peace to you this week as you walk in the Spirit. Remember to eye bar, to study, build up your library, walk by faith, and to check your own sanctification. Examine yourselves as to how your sanctification is going and look for those pieces of uh, what fruit the Spirit might be producing in you. If you're lacking any fruit at all, you might want to go back through your process there and see if you're actually uh, doing your part to allow the Spirit to, to bear fruit through you. So God bless you this week. Happy New Year. 2021 should be an interesting year, especially here in the United States. God bless you and see you soon.